Let me introduce Adam Nicholson, who grew up, as I think you know, in Sissinghurst Castle in Kent, the family home of his grandparents, Vita Sackville West and Harold Nicholson. He was educated at Eton and then at Magdalen College, Cambridge. After university, he became a travel writer and won the Somerset Maughan Award for Frontiers, which was about a journey he made through Eastern Europe. In the mid-80s, Adam Nicholson founded Toucan Books, which he served as publishing director for five years. He has since joined the London Daily Telegraph as a columnist. He's the author of Wetland, Life in the Somerset Levels, which won the British Topography Prize, Restoration, God's Secretaries, The Making of the King James Bible, which is a book uh, I read just about six months ago, and I recommend it highly uh, to you. It's a wonderful evocation of the cultural and political environment in which uh, that great translation was created. And then Sea Room, which was shortlisted for the Duff Cooper Prize. And Adam Nicholson notes that he lives on a small beef and sheep farm in Sussex with his wife and five children. Um, I mention that because he's still very much an adventurer at heart. And what he's going to talk about this evening is obviously the topic of his new book, the subject of his new book, Seamanship, A Voyage Along the Wild Coasts of the British Isles. Please join me in welcoming Adam Nicholson to the Boston Athenaeum. Well, thank you very much, Richard. It's, it's lovely to be here in this wonderful, wonderful place, of which I'm ashamed to say I didn't know a single thing before this evening. But I have been given an equally wonderful whistle-stop tour running, and that is not an exaggeration, to the second, third, fourth, and fifth floors <laughs> in the last ten minutes. <laughs> and very beautiful they are. Well, if we could have the lights out, please. Uh, I'm going to talk this evening about a journey that I made last year along the Atlantic shore of the British Isles. As Richard said, I'd been spending two years, two quite long years, writing a book about the, make, the making of the King James Bible. And two long years writing about the King James Bible, in fact, it means two long years reading other people's books about the King James Bible. And after that length of time, one does long slightly for a breath of fresh air. And... Uh, the, um, the nearest and best version of fresh air that there is to someone who, who lives in the south of England is the wild western shore of the British Isles, of which that is a map. And I think you only have to look at that map to see that, well, for anyone in any way attuned to cartography, to see in it a place dripping in adventure and excitement. Those uh, notched and nobbled headlands and inlets and bays and islands stretching all the way up to Orkney, Shetland and, well, for this purpose, the pharaohs are adopted to the British Empire. Um, uh, and I just, uh, I just wanted to get out there. It was a place to go, a very, very wild place. This is a, a rather nice Sunday afternoon off the coast of Western Ireland in July. And it's that that I really wanted, a kind of, you know, exposure of being out there, a place where this sort of thing happens. <laughs> now, um, it wasn't as if I'd never been to, to this world, because, uh, this is a bit of technology which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Yes, here we are. Up here, uh, in the in the Hebrides, off the northwest coast of Scotland, are some very little islands called the Shants, which means the Holy Islands in Gaelic. And my father bought them in 1937 for uh, £1,200. And they are an exquisitely beautiful, gentle and lovely place. Although they are out on this wild and difficult shore, they have a kind of 
sweetness about them. That's my father on the left. This was taken some time ago. Me on the right and my son Tom in the middle who was 21 in March of this year and for his 21st birthday I gave him these islands as, as my father had given them to me when I was 21. That's my dog about to commit suicide on the right-hand side there. <laughs> But you can see that they have a kind of you know, huge, dramatic glory about them. These huge cliffs and extraordinary um, uh, populations of seabirds there. And this very sweet little house on, one of the, on the shore of one of the islands. It was built by the novelist Compton Mackenzie, who, who owned the islands in the 1920s, before he, like most writers, went bust and had to sell them to my father. But it is that mixture of the ext extraordinarily sweet and homely and gentle in, an, in a context or a frame of great violence and exposure which drew me to the idea of uh, making a, uh, a longer trip up the Western Isles. This is the sea that surrounds the Shants, the Minch, and I had... Um, several years ago now, when writing the book that Richard mentioned, Sea Room, which is a description of these islands, uh, decided that it was no good simply writing about these islands. I had to describe the sea around them. You couldn't possibly know an island. You couldn't know really what an island meant unless you knew the nature of the sea that surrounded them. And there is, of course, an extremely deep and long tradition of seafaring in these seas. And on the mainland of Harris, just uh, near the Shants, uh, on the tomb of a, uh, a MacLeod chieftain, a man we all, all Nicholsons hate because he raped the uh, heiress of the Nicholson chief, killed her father, and dispossessed the Nicholsons of all the lands they had owned until then. And ever since, we've been living rather on the margins of life and all MacLeods living in their centre. But anyway, this boat is carved on his tomb, hateful man. And it's an early... I think if I asked any of you here to date that, you would say, well, probably mm, 9th century, 10th century, a Viking ship. It is, in fact, carved in about 1540. But I think that makes a point that in these places, on these kind of remote western shores of not only uh, the British Isles but of Europe itself, tradition and continuity and an extraordinary persistence of forms is one of the governing facts of life. And that uh, Viking galley was, I took that picture to a boat builder in Harris and said, could you make me one of those? He came up with this though which is not exactly the same and is a damn sight smaller but carries in it a lot of the uh, habits of boat building which are undoubtedly inherited from the Norse tradition and can be matched identically with the kind of boat building that goes on on the west coast of Norway and, and Denmark today. This man is called John Macaulay, the severest man I think I've ever met I went out sailing with him early on when I was just trying out this boat for the first time. And I said to him, do you think, John, I'll make a good sailor? And he paused, as one does, and said, if you had another life, Adam. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, there, Freya, I called her, after the uh, Norse goddess of, well, in shorthand, of sex and well-being. A lovely, big, fat, broad thing, as you can see she is there, but not big. And sailed with her out to the chance, that's the chance in, in the distance there. A genuinely terrifying and difficult 16-mile journey across the Minch. Uh, I said to John Macaulay when he first built it, that doesn't seem to be much buoyancy uh, built into the boat, John. <laughs> and he said, no, no, there isn't. And that was the end of the conversation. So, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
it can be a rather alarming, a large and alarming sea when you're in a small 16-foot wooden boat. Uh, but I survived, as you can tell. And this, this question of, I mean, that boat, which I still have and still love, uh, is really a kind of inheritance from, you know, from the Viking North. And when I was writing the book about the Shants that year, I went along, of course, all the, uh, the shorelines of those islands. And these were the two most extraordinary objects I found washed up by the tide. On the left is a piece of pumice stone, a piece of lava. And I had it analysed by the uh, Geological Museum in, um, in London. And it came from Montserrat. It had been floated there. Uh, on the uh, North Atlantic Drift. And on the right is a, is a, is a nut uh, called uh, a sea nut in the Hebrides, or even St. Mary's nut. Uh, but it is, in fact, the seed of a, uh, a tree called the Entada gigas, which grows in the Caribbean. And so these... Uh, it is an important point, this, that these things which certainly to, to us in Britain feel like places that are absolutely out and lonely and sort of orphaned or widowed almost by their geographical circumstances are in fact deeply bound into you know, much larger global currents. Now I, uh, I got some archaeologists to come and uh, in the foreground there you can just about see uh, their excavations and in the excavations in the higher layers, we found large numbers of the animal bones which the people living there had been feeding on. Uh, all the usual you would expect, sheep, cows, horses, dogs, donkeys, um, as well as many, many seabirds. We were looking for the bones of the great orc, which would have been a discovery, but sadly failed to find them. And also, this sort of pottery imported to these islands, this is 18th century pottery, made largely in Stoke-on-Trent. You know, the most sort of charmingly pretty things in, the, in one of the most austere environments you could think of. But in the floor, actually buried in the clay floor on which these fragments were found, uh, on the last day of the excavation, we found this extraordinary object. It was upside down in the floor. And uh, it's, it's a, I, if I had it here, it would be about that size, like a kind of loaf. And what it turns out to be is what uh, uh, archaeologists and historians of uh, early Christianity in the British Isles have called a pillow stone. In the life of St. Columba, written by St. Adamnan in the uh, 9th century, I think, he describes how Columba, you know, the great founder of Iona and the sort of prince, bishop of uh, Celtic Christianity, never slept without a stone under his head. And when he died, the stone was placed on his head in his grave. And almost certainly this stone was carved by a Christian hermit who came to these islands, uh, perhaps in the 7th, 8th century A.D., to find there, you know, what they called the desert, the desert in the ocean, the place of remote austerity in which they could or where they could simply through the, the rigor and difficulty and discipline and even hostility of the place uh, bring themselves closer to God. And this stone uh, I carried with me all year uh, on the longer journey, which I'm now going to describe to you, the journey up the whole western uh, shore of the British Isles, as a kind of totem and memorial of, uh, of the motives of the people who had done this, what, 1,300, 1,400 years before. And, I mean, there's no way that I could claim that I was in any way repeating the experiences of Dark Age hermits. But it's seemed to me like a, an encapsulation and a, a fulfillment, really, of our, that's meaning us, central, civilized, urbanized people, 
this was a kind of symbol of an engagement of that world, of the Romanized Christian world, with the world on the very edge of the wild, of the rough. Now, um, there, is, there is the route. It is a long, difficult shore, and one in which the Atlantic, of course, onto which the Atlantic drives very, very hard. Uh, there's a huge sort of three, four thousand miles fetch on the waves coming onto that shore. It is a lee shore. It's a difficult bit of country. And to uh, survive it, I, or rather a very marvellous organisation called Barclays Marine Finance, <laughs> um, acquired this, which is uh, uh, a catch, as you can see. It's a cutter-rigged gaff catch, two headsails, a main and a mizzen, uh, built on the, on the model of uh, a, a sort of Colin Archer uh, model, if that means anything to you, who designed a whole series of sailing lifeboats in Norway in the 19th century. A big wooden larch on big oak frames, um, a great mother of a ship, and uh, exactly the kind of thing, unlike the little Freya, uh, which one could uh, thrive and have a great time in on uh, the Atlantic shore. Now what I've got here is a, a little tape of some of our uh, wilder and more exciting moments, which I should explain first that um, although I and a friend of mine, George Ferher, set out on this journey uh, rather purely to begin with, just he and I and occasionally some friends, inevitably quite soon I ran out of money and in order to finance the rest of it, I persuaded a television company to make a, a television series about it, which pretty well trashed the uh, holiness of the trip. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, gave us a very good time and has resulted in the images which, if we could have the video, there will be a slight pause because there's a technological changeover. I hope you will see now.
Sagittarium Nostrum Nomine Domine. We should bring that to the because this is another thing. Father Michael and most of the monks accompany Adam back to George. Stop. There we are. I wonder if we could. There we are. Now I'm sorry though. That was another episode which is too different to to go into at this stage. But um, I, that's, I only showed you that film really to, to, uh, to show you what an absolutely marvellous thing being, at a, being on a boat at sea is and what kind of deep, deep pleasure it can give one. And sad to say, I, I, sold, uh, I sold that boat last week and so it fills me with terrible nostalgia to see that. Uh, it now belongs to a manufacturer of laboratory equipment from Huddersfield. <laughs> Perhaps you'll have him here next year. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we set off, George and I, from uh, Falmouth in the uh, southwest of England and headed across the uh, Celtic Sea to southwest Ireland. And although there was some coming and going, as you can see from that map there, we were really headed for um, a famous place off the uh, southwest tip of Ireland. Two islands, which you can just see in the distance there, which are so halfway between rocks and islands, called the Skelligs, which means the rough places in Old Irish. Uh, the nearer of the two, Skellig, little Skellig, is a, a, a gannetry, a huge and dramatic gannetry. And the further of the two is Skellig Michael, which is, for me anyway, one of the... Well, and maybe even the uh, central node of this whole Atlantic world. Um, it is uh, an absolutely extraordinary place. It's um, 700 feet high that, to the highest point, but only 44 acres in extent. And this place, which you would think of as utter unadorned wilderness in fact became one of the uh, central places of pilgrimage in Ireland between about 700 and about 1300 uh, AD. Uh, the site of a monastery which uh, monks built just on the near side, that the sort of grey patch which you can just about make out on the near side in the middle of those green grassy slopes. And all over Skellig Michael, the monks built these astonishing staircases. They have been slightly restored, but not radically. And in essence, that is the work of people who came out to this distant rock 13 or 1400 years ago, exactly contemporary with that pillow stone. And I hope you can see from there the... Uh, incredible subtlety and uh, delicacy with which this uh, monastic, sort of new monastic Christian identity is imposed on this very strong sort of natural place. And there is a kind of incredible symbiosis uh, on Skellig Michael between the beauties of elegant design and the vigour of nature in the raw. Inside those steps, inside every riser of those steps, storm petrels still nest. So as you walk up each step, you hear beneath your feet little cheeps coming from the, the nesting seabirds inside them. At the top, there is a little, like a little, uh, sort of a miniature and constrained a uh, city of God, in a way, a very carefully planned place with this central lecht, it's called, like an altar, covered in white quartzite stones because for the Celtic Christians, the white stone was a symbol and an embodiment of purity uh, and of the divine. Uh, with beyond it, you can just make out, a, again, a tiny, I mean, it's, a, it's smaller than this platform I'm standing on here, a graveyard in which the 10 or 12 monks uh, living on the monastery, in the monastery would be buried. It is uh, a place uh, dripping in 
the kind of what in the in the significance of uh, so the civilized arriving in the wild. These are the beehive cells which the monks built for themselves. But if you go in there on a stormy day, they are still so well built that there isn't a, a sound of the storm that comes in there. Uh, and this is, uh, there is the orc, just, uh, the, my boat just anchored on the little shelf of rock that sticks out underwater from the base of of Skellig Michael, looking back to the mainland of Ireland. It is somewhere that is, uh, for me anyway, more resonant with uh, a kind of spirituality than, than any other place I've been. And what is extraordinary about it is that it seems to be almost unknown. I went there with uh, an Irish archaeologist who had worked on the islands previously as their curator. And she told me one evening that she'd been there on her own after the tourist boats had left and knew that the, the whole island was deserted. And went up, started up those paths to the monastery just to see that everything was all right there. And as she was walking up those, those ancient steps, heard or thought she heard coming from the monastery at the top, the sound, the faint sound of Christian hymns being chanted. And the nearer she climbed, the louder the chanting became. And as she arrived in that little monastic precinct, she looked in through the door of the, uh, the chapel there, the little chapel there, and it's a very low door, you have to, like many uh, ancient Christian sites, you have to submit as you go into the, into the chapel. Through the doorway she saw, I think it was four pairs of sandaled feet with black gowns sort of wafting around them. And knocked her head against the nearest rock to check that she was kind of alive. And went in and found some orthodox Greek monks who had come from Athos to Skellig, knowing that it was a place, of course, the church was unified then, it was only one church, uh, and had come and had stayed after the tourist boats had left so that they could reenact the, uh, the history that was there and the meaning that was there. Onwards, though, onwards up the west coast of Ireland, to this extraordinary place, another site of a great uh, medieval Irish monastery called High Island. Again, one of the major uh, pilgrimage sites of, of Ireland in the Middle Ages. Tens of thousands of people, it's recorded, coming here on pilgrimage every year. It's unthinkable now. Of course, no one is there. And just north of that, off the coast of Sligo, this is the island of Inish Murray, uh, with uh, that phenomenal uh, wall, uh, eight feet thick and 12 feet high, built by the monks probably in the ninth century, as a kind of equivalent on, you can see they don't exactly have the spectacular geography that uh, Skellig Michael gave, gave those monks down there, but that wall sort of reenacts for Inish Murray what the Atlantic itself does for Skellig. It defines the holy place sort of more dramatically, really, than, uh, than, than uh, anything else could. And I think that it's, um, it is amazing to me that out there on the western edge of the, um, of the British Isles, there is this whole band of meaning which was um, magnetically attractive to people in the, in the Dark Ages for many centuries. It's not as if it was a brief sort of flicker. You know, we're talking maybe, what, three, 300, 400 years of, of this sort of being a central, marginal place. You know, the margin somehow as, the, as, as where meaning was most deeply accessible. And this is back on the chance where by the time George and I and the York got up there again, the archaeologists had discovered the footings of one of those beehive huts on the, on the islands that, uh, 
this must have been the place where that, that cross stone had come from. And this, undoubtedly, too, is one of the, you can hardly see it there, I'm afraid, the, one of the field walls which uh, define the monastic enclosure on the Shans. But one thing, one, one shocking thing which the archaeologists discovered on the Shans was that on top of that layer, where they found the remains of the monastic life, was a series of large, complete, but totally smashed pots. All over the floor of that round house, that beehive hut, clearly the, uh, there had been pots standing there full of water or milk, or whatever it was, and all at once had been smashed. And after that moment, uh, the building was no longer occupied. Now, it's very, very difficult to date things in archaeology in this environment. Very little sort of diagnostic evidence survives. But it seems as if that uh, ending of the, of the monastic moment, really, in the Shants, and it, it happened all over the, the Western Isles at the same time, coincided with the building of buildings like this, which you can hardly see here, uh, which is the form of boat-shaped house, which is very similar to houses that have been excavated on the western shore of Norway and Denmark. And almost certainly that ending of the monastic moment uh, was brought about and coincided with the arrival of the Vikings from the north. And... I don't think that anywhere in the Western Isles has that been more dramatically shown than here. That smashing of the, of the place, left in situ, abandoned, and then just up the hill from it, the building of a boat-shaped house by, by Vikings. It was, in that way, it was simply a kind of window in history. You know, this glowing, holy moment when uh, Celtic monks saw wild places as somehow, you know, near to God. We, um, we headed on from the Shants uh, up to Orkney, but then finally to the Pharaohs. And the reason that I went to the Pharaohs in the end was that a lot of our journey had been uh, involved with civilizations and places and, and people whose lives were over and finished and abandoned. That whole western shore is really a story of abandonment. But the pharaohs are quite different. The pharaohs settled by Vikings in uh, about 900,000 AD, and this incredibly dramatic, volcanic, basalt-based uh, landscape of great, rich summer greenness and, and uh, wild, wild careers. Uh, uh, are still occupied by the Faroese in a way which Vikings would recognize. This is a, a, ho a farmstead on the island of Koltor in the Faroes, and you can see its collection of buildings in the middle there, surrounded by its uh, uh, remains of its cultivations. And that these are the uh, building, those grass, beautiful grass roof buildings. Uh, and I stayed with the man who lived here, and his name was, or is, Björn Patterson, which is as good as a Viking name as you could come up with, really. But um, he's a sheep farmer. Uh, he's so deeply engaged with the natural life of uh, the pharaohs. And he also designs and sells software. <laughs> In, <laughs> in that house on the left there, for uh, Danish companies doing oil exploration off the west coast of Africa. He's an absolute, as you can imagine, I think, from that description, a marvellous man. He, uh, we, we, I went to sheep gathering with him on one of the, uh, the steep hills of his island. And... Uh, we were having a discussion climbing up and down these hills about what our, our favorite seabirds were. And I said that all year long we'd been accompanied in the Ork by 
these absolutely wonderful Manx shearwaters. I don't know if you have them here, but you know they're so these black scimitar-shaped birds that just skim very low and tight over the, uh, over the waves around you, fast and sort of stealth bomber seabirds. And uh, so I said, Bjorn, yes, I think it's, uh, it's the Manx shearwater. And uh, Bjorn said, yes, yes, um, they're delicious, aren't they? <laughs> and uh, I thought that was magnificent. A man selling, selling his uh, software, dangling himself off these terrifying sea cliffs. And... Um, a very dab hand with, well, this always shocks audiences in England and here, I know, making a very good pilot whale stew, which he gave me, uh, and uh, eating, uh, eating the birds and sort of engaging with the nature of his world. And I think, well, I mean, there are, there are several things to say about Bjorn Patterson, that his name is a Viking name, but he, his family has undoubtedly been here in, in, on this site and largely in these buildings since 1450. He has records going back to 1450. Björn says that his family has actually been there since 950, but no one bothered to record it earlier on. And that his name, Björn, is obviously a you know, Scandinavian name, but Patterson means um, Patrick's son the son of, a, of an Irishman who was there before them. And although there is no evidence on Kultur of there having been any Irish hermits uh, there before the Vikings, Bjorn himself is convinced that that is what his name means and that somehow that these two traditions, which in some ways embrace the whole of this British, Faroese, Viking, Irish Danish Atlantic world are united in him and uh, I felt that it was thriving and doing well in him now. Well that was the end of my journey and it's uh, the end of my talk <laughs> but I'd be very uh, happy to answer any questions if anyone has some. Richard says there's only one, been one occasion in the last 150 years where no one has asked a question. The intention of the journey was that it should be from uh, equinox to equinox. So we started pretty well mid-March and the idea was to end mid-September. But in fact, inevitably, we we leaked on, and uh, that film, that, that, that well over bit of filming, if that's what you're talking about, when it was windy and we only had a staysail and reefed main up, that was in, I think, something October the 10th or something, very windy. And the Pharaohs are an exciting place to sail in October. <laughs> there are serious winds and, uh, and serious tides. The, uh, the Atlantic streams through those sounds between the islands in uh, nine and ten knot tide streams. Uh, and uh, you can find yourself, as we found ourselves at one point, sailing as hard as we could in a force nine and going backwards. <laughs> yes, sir. You, are you going to say a few words about God's secretaries or am I going to say a few words about them? Uh, Would you like me to say a few words about them? Well, I, uh, I met him with great interest along with uh, Stephen uh, Greenblatt's book, uh, Will of the World, in which I found an extraordinary quotation which leads me to the suggestion. Uh, without the great English translation of the New Testament, and the sonorous, deeply resonant book of common prayer. It's difficult to imagine William Shakespeare. And your work 
Andrews and Shakespeare. Oh, you said Andrews and Shakespeare. You mean? Well, I mean, it's it's difficult to say that um, there would be no Shakespeare without the uh, translation of the King James Bible, because Shakespeare had written most of his plays by the time the King James Bible came out. But of course, that is rather mean and unfair thing to say. Because the King James Bible was drawing on the long tradition of English translations of the Bible made all through the 16th century. I think if I had to choose by, between uh, who I would prefer to have dinner with, I would choose Shakespeare any day. <laughs> Although I know that's a trivial reaction to your question. You've asked me to change gear rather fiercely. <laughs> I mean... Say that again. How much of a crew did you have on board the boat? Oh, on board the boat, there was just me and my friend George Fairhurst. There was just the two of us. And he is a very good sailor. He's a much better sailor than I am. Is he still your friend? <laughs> <laughs> People who know about sailing say, do not say, how long did it take for you to fall out? They say, when did you fall out? <laughs> and we fell out really badly, about halfway through. Uh, the difficulty was, well, it's a traditional difficulty, that uh, I, I and Barclays Marine Finance were nominally the owner of the boat and deciding where we should go. And George was the skipper, and this is a famous difficulty. Uh, I was asking him to uh, take us places, and then he was telling me what to do, how to get there. And that, that kind of layered and conflicted authority is not a good recipe for a relationship. <laughs> but we love each other very deeply. <laughs> and everything's all right now. <laughs> yes, madam. Well, the question is, how did we get to shore? Well, we had a little inflatable on the, on the boat, which was stowed away and could be pumped up. Uh, and the TV people, of course, were a huge, uh, a huge presence in the whole thing. Some of those shots that I, I showed you of us uh, sailing along from uh, a shot from a helicopter. The helicopter had been booked several days before to come and film us on that day. <coughs> And, of course, that day turned out to be very nearly dead calm. <laughs> so we had no lovely 30-knot breeze to uh, have us cracking along to look beautiful. As you could see, the boat looked very beautiful there. And so the uh, director of the TV uh, film said, well, I think helicopters make quite a good breeze, don't they? <laughs> uh, and hung the helicopter here. And we sailed along on the helicopter's wind, <laughs> which they then filmed from the helicopter. <laughs> what is more perfect than that? <laughs> so, yes, madam. Twenty odd years ago, the Faroese were clearly having some moral problems with the pilot rail rides. They no longer needed the food since they had perfect. I think that the uh, Faroese relationship to the pilot whale uh, and the herding of the schools of pilot whales into the uh, bays and fjords of, of the islands uh, looks pretty bad when you see it on you know, the Discovery Channel and whatever it is, and the, or, or in, the, in the flesh, and the blood-red sea which, uh, you know, is made around these uh, knifed animals. And I think anyone who sees that is, um, you could at least say, sobered by it. But I think you have to see that in a, in a larger context, in a larger cultural context. And for me, the vitality of the Faroese culture 
its extraordinarily dynamic self-sufficiency, its sense of its own worth, of the pharaohs being the center of their own world, was so strikingly different from the sense of marginalization and of a kind of fading weakness that you find certainly in the Hebrides, certainly on the uh, western shore of, uh, of Ireland, of a feeling that, you know, somehow e every act of their life has to be done looking over their shoulder to the great urban, economic and industrialized centers over there. And there is no sense in the pharaohs that the anything needs to come from the outside. This is where we are. This is what we do. This is how we are. And that is not good for the pilot whales. <laughs> it is not good for the fulmers that get caught out of the net or the puffins that get uh, snatched out of their burrows. But it is very, very good for the pharaohs. And I think if you have to choose, myself, between uh, a, an indigenous culture uh, choosing to do its own thing and being allowed to choose its, do, do its own thing, or have them submit to disapproval in London or Berlin or, or Boston, I would always choose the first. Yes, sir. Well, I don't think that the Normans ever got up to the pharaohs. I mean, they are a long way out. And uh, they're obviously very much in a Viking world. And, uh, I mean, one of, their, one of the interesting things about them is that culturally they are Norwegian. But politically they are Danish. And culturally, all their... Culturally they are Norwegian but politically they belong to Denmark. And so I think that is one of the reasons that they have maintained their sense of their own identity. They are a Norse island in a Danish polity. And uh, I don't think Normans got up there. Yes? No, you're absolutely right. The Normans didn't even get in Scotland. No. Oh, well, It sounds very intriguing, and I don't know about it. I know, obviously, there is also the idea, the, the St. Brendan uh, story you know about. And, the, and there are, I think, I don't know if it was discovered to be a fake, but there are thought to have been some Irish uh, inscriptions found uh, in, the, uh, in the United States. It sounds marvelous. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one more then, thank you. Did you get a chance to uh, lay any of the, the, the free stone out there? Do any, any, any of the masonry that you're sort of surrounded with? Did I have a chance to do any of the masonry, did you say? Yeah, stack a couple of stones here. Uh, <laughs> I didn't do much art en route. George thinks of himself as something of a sculptor. Uh, but no, I was perfectly happy to just. Uh, sit back and take it in. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much for... Uh, having